getting it to a, a point where we can um, study and bring back um, a, I think, a very important intervention in the Canadian economy and in the lives of low-income Canadians. Thank you very much. Senator Martin. I move the adjournment of the debate. The Honourable, it is moved by the Honourable Senator Martin, seconded by the Honourable Senator Matters, that further debate be adjourned to the next sitting of the Senate. If you are opposed to the motion, please say no. Carried. Order number 19, Bill S. 234, numéro 19, projet de loi S. 234. Senator No. Senator No. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Senators, I move that Bill S-234 be read the second time. The Honourable Senator, it is moved by the Honourable Senator No, seconded by the Honourable Senator Wells, that the bill be read a second time. On debate, Senator No. President. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To speak to my Senate public bill entitled An Act to Amend the Investment Canada Act, Mandatory National Security Review of Investments by Foreign State Owned Enterprises. Dear colleagues, as may you may recall, this is the second time I'm introducing this bill. Bill S-233 or 4 is my former Senate public bill S-257 that I introduced back in December 2018 which died on the order paper because of the 2019 federal election. I have introduced this bill and reintroduced it again, inspired by the rising global investment presented by foreign state-owned enterprise OSE in Canada, but also because I'm still extremely troubled by the real and increasing threat they pose to our national security, our critical infrastructure, our sensitive imaging technology, as well as our key resource sectors. This increase of extensive foreign interest in our companies and assets and their evolving security implication make us to consider whether full-scale security review of proposed investment in Canada by foreign state-owned enterprise should be mandatory rather than discriminatory and whether foreign countries should have a tremendous stake in our economic growth. These increased threat, especially to our national security, have become so pressing in the past few years, and they ought to be properly addressed more so now in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exposed and in some cases even aggravated our country vulnerability. Why the government assesses all foreign investment through a net benefit test and from a basic security perspective was went to Investment Canada Act, including those that do not lead to a change of control, the highest level of security screening known at the National Security Review exclusively remains subject to a cabinet discretion and continue to be sparingly applied with SOEs. This in turn leave the government dangerously openly to a panoply of security risks, and it fails to consistently perform its due diligence. As it currently stands, when a foreign state ownership enterprise presents an investment under the set of the rule laid out in the Act, Canadian must wait for the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to consult with the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness to decide if the potentially injurious foreign investment should be referred to the government and council before a proposition may be ordered to be reviewed from a national security standpoint. Following the review, which has explained soon, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development would again consult with the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness to either refer the investment to the government and council along with the report on the review and recommendations, or if satisfied that the investment would not be injurious to the national security, notify the foreign investor that no further action will be taken. Based on the recommendation and finding to this high-level review, the Government Council has authority under subsection 25.4 bracket 1 to decide either to authorize the investment, disallow the investment, require the investor to divest control of Canadian business or its investment 
of an entity. Honorable Senator, Bill S-234 proposed a technical change to the Investment Canada Act that would ensure that Governor and Council would no longer have the discretion but rather the duty to scrutinize all foreign state-sponsored enterprise investment from a national security standpoint before reaching a decision. Additionally, this bill would also be an effective tool to address threat from the beginning. Where appropriate, it would help the government identify potential issues in advance so it is able to proactively address them and in turn help clarify any issue and avoid delays. Under the Act, this review would include, but it's not limited to, the following national security factors that are outlined in Section 8 of the guidelines of the National Security Review of the Investment, such as potential effect on the investment on Canada defense capability and interest, including but not limited to the defense industrial base and the defense establishment, the potential effect on the investment on the transfer of the sensitive technology or know-how outside Canada, involvement in the research, manufacture or sale of good technology identified in Section 35 of the Defense Production Act, potential impact on the investment on the supply of critical goods and services to Canadians or the supply of goods and services to the Government of Canada, the potential impact of the investment on critical minerals and critical mineral supply chain, the potential impact on the investment on the Security Canada critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure referred to processes, system facilities, technology, networks, asset, and service ascension to the health, safety, security, and economic well-being of Canadians, and the effective functioning of the government. The potential of investment to enable foreign surveillance on espionage. The potential of the investment to hinder current or future intelligence or law enforcement operation. The potential impact of the investment of Canada international interests, including foreign relationship. The potential of the investment to involve or facilitate the activities of illicit actors such as terrorists, terrorist organization, organized of crime, and corrupt official, foreign officials, and the potential of the investment to enable access to sensitive personal data that could be leveraged to harm Canadian national security through its exploitation, including, but not limited to, personal identifiable health or genetic, or genetic test result, biometric, financial, communication, geolocation, personal data concerning government officials, including member of the military or intelligence community. At this point, allow me to say, the risk factors identified in the national security guidelines are not limited to those I have described, as there is also a non-exhaustive list of sensitive technology areas in Annex A of the guidelines. The list is updated regularly when necessary. Some of the risk factors are capable of being interpreted very broadly, particularly the concept of critical infrastructure, which is defined to include sectors ranging from the more obvious one of the transportation, energy and utilities, safety, government, water, to broad sectors such as finance, manufacturing, food, health, as well as information and communication technology. These thriving sectors are increasingly considered to be matters of national security. We can, and really should, also debate what constitutes sensitive technologies. However, I will limit my remark at this second reading to the principle of the bill, which recommends a realistic change to strengthen our investment review process against threats posed by state-owned enterprise without removing the final decision-making power of the Governor and Council. This bill puts forward assessing very new proposed investment by a state-owned enterprise under national security provision of the Act to ensure the nature of the asset of businesses, activities, and the parties, including the potential of what third-party influence involved in the transaction would automatically receive the due consideration required to ensure that foreign governments are not exploiting an investment deal through the guise of their state-owned enterprise to the detriment of our security. This provision would ensure 
that all income and state-owned investment was subject to mandatory review and properly vetted by our national security review process, supported by Public Safety Canada, Intelligence Agency, and other investigate bodies prescribed in the regulation before the Governor and Council make an informed decision. This bill would therefore impose the necessary checks and balance on a mandatory basis to protect our economic growth and national security against investments that pose a potential threat. Honorable Senator. Honorable Senators, as I mentioned earlier, this bill will be an important tool for the government to identify potential problems in advance and, if necessary, to address them proactively. Bill S-234 will allow the government to resolve problems and avoid delays, particularly with respect to investments made by foreign state-owned enterprises, which, among other things, may result in the transfer of sensitive dual-use technology, sensitive data, or know-how, may adversely affect the provision of essential services to Canadians or to the government, or may allow surveillance or espionage by a foreign country. The Investment Canada Act already has an excellent and clear definition of what a state-owned enterprise is, namely, the government of a foreign state or any state or local government thereof or any agency of such government, a unit controlled or influenced directly or indirectly by a, a government or agency described in subsection A, an individual acting under the authority of or under the influence, directly or indirectly, of a government or agency described in subsection A. Honorable Senators, unfortunately, in its current form, the wording of the act that I've described imposes several successive administrative steps for national security issues before Cabinet can decide whether or not a proposed investment by a foreign state-owned enterprise in a key sector of our economy should be subject to an enhanced security screening. It's high time that Canada's foreign investment policy reflect sound principles based on national security. Bill S-234 thus proposes a precise and effective control measure that would ensure that foreign direct investment by state-owned enterprises remains part of our national wealth. I would like to reiterate what I've just said so that it's clearly understood. Foreign direct investment, including investment by foreign state-owned enterprises, plays an important role in Canada's national wealth in our and in our country's economic prosperity. However, dear colleagues, we must remember that our economic prosperity is an integral part of our national security. We will seek to provide future government with effect to, to guarantee security of our investment climate. Consequently, the bill would implement a mandatory, non-discriminatory and predictable security review of investment by state, foreign state-owned enterprise in Canada. Honorable Senators, foreign governments are developing and deploying a growing range of capability, capabilities to leverage, manipulate and advance their own national security interests through the guise of their state-owned enterprise, especially during the current context of the pandemic. For instance, some countries do their state-owned enterprise to exert their economy, ideological and geopolitical interests through such techniques as stealing intellectual property, influencing other nations' domestic politics, conducting cyber espionage, and even developing cyber weapons. These legal commercial entities in Canada can provide foreign government with a strategic advantage to inflict damage to our, to our critical infrastructure, still our sensitive data, and even influence our democratic process if they are not properly vetted. As I mentioned, the current government's effort and risk-inclined approach to encourage foreign investment represent a notable shift from previous government. Several lessons drawn from the experience with the Chinese state ownership enterprise clearly indicate that our investment policy needs to be updated 
and optimized for the world today and tomorrow. I will now highlight some of the high-profile example to better understand Canada's approach when it comes to investment from China. In 2017, the Canada government review and approve some controversial transaction from Chinese investor. One of those transactions was the takeover by the private Chinese telecom giant Hatira of Vancouver, based in Oxide International, the Canadian satellite communication company that was producing and selling satellite equipment and transceiver. Northside technology were used by uh, NAV Canada, Canada Air Navi Navigation Service Provider, by the American military, the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, and by many other high-profile customers such as NATO, Boeing, etc. This controversial takeover drew criticism from security experts but also from one of our most trusted allies, the U.S. In mid-June of 2017, Commissioner Michael Vessel from the U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission told the Globe and Mail, and I quote, Canada's approval of the sale of NORSAP to a Chinese entity raised significant national security concern for the United States as the company is a supplier to our military. Canada may be willing to jeopardize its own secu security interests to gain favor with China, end of quote. Despite legitimate concern being raised by security experts and the United States, the transaction was approved by the Canadian government. This approval was granted without a full national security review. It is worth noting that the government decision to not proceed with a full-fledged national security review was an incredible, disturbing, and dangerous that it didn't process properly assess the actual impact and consequences of the transaction, as well as the grave security risks imposed to transfer the propriety of technology to a firm from a ruthless authoritarian state. The NOSAT takeover has demonstrated that even through the government approach regarding investment from China is continuously evolving and that we can expect certain type of investment to undergo more scrutiny. The government recklessness with the five has highlighted the extraordinary risky level of comfort the government has established when it comes to the Chinese investing in critical and sensitive sectors that are of paramount importance, not to just our national security, but also to that of our allies. Some of the other high-profile and controversial transactions, including the, the following, the takeover by Anbang Insurance Vancouver-based retirement concept, the largest provider in long-term care in British Columbia, operating in British Columbia, Calgary, Montreal. In this case, the transaction was approved by the government without adequately being addressed, in spite of significant questions raised by the U.S. about Anbang murky ownership structure, as well as tied to the Chinese Communist government. Instead of conducting a national security review of the transaction, the government simply approved it on the basis that it would be a net benefit to our economy. In 2018, the Chinese Communist government seized the control of Ang Bang, and in 2019, it created the state-owned enterprise Daija Insurance Group to take over band and main insurance operation. The government screwed up so badly that retirement concept, the largest retirement home company in BC, is now owned by the Chinese SOE. Another significant development concerned the national security review of the Chinese investment in sensitive Canada industry, in spite of the previous conservative government decision barring requests from Hong Kong-based ONET communication to take over Montreal-based ITF technology. In 2015, the Liberal government reevaluated the investment request and subsequently approved the transaction in 2017. It is a baffling that such approval was even granted, given to a known SOE, the China Electronic Corporation has a 25% ownership stake of ONET. Thankfully, another incident when it comes to ACON, acquisition by the Chinese state-owned enterprise China Communication Construction Company International Holding Limited, was blocked in May 2018 after an extensive national security review. And more recently, at the end of December 2020, 
The government blocked another Chinese takeover after it was subject to a national security review. The proposed sale of MAC Resources share at its Hope Bay Gold Mining Project in Nunavut to the SOE's Shandong Gold Mining Corporation Limited was rejected. Another controversial high-risk transaction occurred in July 2020 when the government awarded standing offer of Nuktek, a Chinese government-earned firm with close link to the most senior echelon of the Chinese Communist Party and to the People's Liberation Army, in which has been described as a threat to Western security by the U.S. National Security Council to supply sensitive security equipment for all 170 of our embassy consulate and High Commissioner worldwide. Last week, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Government Cooperation and Estimate released its report into the government procurement of security screening equipment at Canada's embassy around the world, specifically focusing its study on the standing offer award to NUCTAC, also known as the Huawei Airport, in which it raised concern regarding market fairness and the security of the federal government assets. The NUCTAC debacle truly stand as an example of how the government continued to fail miserably when it comes to the Chinese SOE, as it recklessly excludes national security consideration by exclusively award contract to the lowest bidder. Miraculously, in November 2020, the government came into its sense and rejected the signing offer. And to this day, it is quite astonishing that the offer was even awarded in the first place. However, the government has yet to make a decision regarding whether or not we will ban Huawei from, its, from our 5G network. As the government still consider Huawei's bet to build the next generation telecommunication network in Canada, all of our Five Eyes members, U.S., Australia, U.K., and New Zealand, have expressed their concern and have all banned Huawei from implementing its technology in their network based on national security grounds, as this Chinese company poses a real significant threat. Other countries, such as Japan, Taiwan, Germany, France, Poland, Czech Republic, etc., have all concluded that Huawei expansion would put their next generation communication infrastructure at risk. Some have been banned it outright, while others have increased their security measure to tighten the 5G network control. Not only our Five Eyes member, but also our current and former CSIS director, national security expert, as well as our senior military official, have also warned the federal government that Huawei cannot be trusted, nor should it be trusted, and it needs to be banned. It is well known that Huawei has strong ties to the Chinese Communist Party, engaged in espionage, and is complicit in the Uyghur genocide. Furthermore, China 2017 national intelligence law gives Beijing the power to compel individuals and companies, both public and private, and those who do business abroad to cooperate with the Chinese intelligence agents or risk prosecution. Honorable Senators, this government and any future government, for that matter, should be running full-fledged national security review when foreign governments are investing in key sectors and critical technology that are intrinsically linked to our national security, such as semiconductors, biotechnology, quantum computing, and nanotechnology, to name a few, especially when they are from countries that have high rates of corruption, poor transparency standards that are responsible for gross violations of human rights, that engage in foreign interference and espionage, and engage in hostage diplomacy and keep threatening the international rule-based order. Therefore, this bill would ensure that Canada does more than a routine national security analysis when foreign state-owned enterprise from China, Iran, Russia, and other countries with questionable backgrounds, die human rights record, zero to, uh, accountability, culture of impunity, and remarkable threat of corruption seek to purchase our company. In an era of advanced technology and artificial intelligence where emerging state-owned multinational continue to occupy an important place in the regional and global market that can harm our economy, our national security, Canadian well-being and safety, and that can 
ultimately led to endangering our national security sovereignty, this issue is of a paramount importance. Honorable Senators, the issue of investment screening is relatively relevant and not only to our economy, our national security and the safety of Canadians, but also to our national relation. This is extremely important, especially now, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, since it has exposed the vulnerabilities of most countries around the world as they experience devaluation of their businesses and are at risk of being taken over by SOE that wish to only exert their economic, ideological, geopolitical interests in such a manner that would harm to their economy national security interests. To that end, in March of this year, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry updated the guidelines on the National Security Review Investment under the Investment Canada Act. These update guidelines, followed by the policy statement of foreign investment review and COVID-19, was released in April of 2020 to take into account the context of pandemic, the policy statement from April 2020, particularly highlight that investment and specifically in the health sector regarding critical goods and services will be subject to enhanced scrutiny. Additionally, the government specified that the statement would continue to apply until our economy recuperates from the repercussions of the pandemic. Furthermore, the guideline issued by the minister under Section 38 of the Act state at the following, Section 7. In particular, some investment into Canada by state-owned enterprise may be motivated by non-commercial imperatives that could harm Canada national security. The government will subject all foreign investment by state-owned investor or private investor assets as being closely tied to or subject to direction from foreign governments to enhance scrutiny under Part 4 dot one, regardless of the values of the investment. First of all, welcome the change and a step in the right direction, but it is not sufficient. First of all, these guidelines are not legally binding. And lastly, the statement would only be in place temporarily. In contrast, the legislative amendment that I am proposing in my bill would achieve the purpose of rendering all investment by SOE subject to a national security review. As such, this statutory amendment would take precedence over any guidelines or interpretation noted issue by the minister. Moreover, Bill S-234 does not make reference to China, Russia, Iran, or any country of specific concern. But it, is, but it is clear that this provision is coherent, and if we turn our attention to the country who present a risk to our national security, many other countries understand that such a safeguard are entirely justifiable, considering the increased threat posed by state-owned enterprise, the prey on manners of technology and data, some with overlapping military and civilian uses, making our security and surveillance concerned about such investment goal. Especially now, with the current context of the pandemic, many countries across the globe have implemented enhanced scrutiny of investment from SOE by imposing greater limitation and restriction. Germany government has started to tighten its role on foreign takeover since 2017, and even more so since 2020, to increase its power to block foreign direct investment, some of these changes regarding transaction that could have implication for the country's security, included the temporary suspension of the deal until a final decision is rendered. Additionally, the risk of level actual danger to the public order or security is no longer required to undertake a review of a potential transaction. Instead, the risk threshold has been lower and the review can be triggered when the potential deal poses likely harm. Over the years, Germany's foreign direct investment regime 
has been extended to include many sectors, groups, and business activities, and that are now subject to mandatory notification requirement, and are deemed critical to the country public system and security. This sector group and businesses activities include critical infrastructure, defense and encryption category, businesses in the healthcare and life science sector, sensitive nature sector such as agriculture, secret patent, and critical technology to name a few. The latest amendment up to enforce in May 1st, 2021, and saw the regime extended to 16 of these sector group and business activities. China itself, citing national security, is not allowing any foreign investor to acquire their national resources. So why should we then? Australia, Foreign Acquisition Takeover Act, FATA, authorized treasurer of Australia under the guidance of the Foreign Investment Review Board to review proposed foreign investment and either prohibit or impose conditions should they be deemed contrary to the national interest. In 2015, the Australian Parliament passed into law three bills that would amend and further strengthen the FATA, repealing and replacing all its substantive provisions. Due to disruptive impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on critical sectors and overall Australian economy, the Treasurer announced on March 29, 2020, that for the duration of the pandemic, all foreign investment will undergo a review irrespective of their value or nature. The Foreign Acquisition and Takeover Amendment Regulation of 2020 for the bill on the 2015 amendment to reflect this new measure. Foreign investment is regulated in the United States under the Foreign Investment in National Security Act of 2007, which grant the President of the United States, following review and by the advisement of the Committee on Foreign Investment of the United States, the authority to suspend or prohibit proposed foreign investment if there is sufficient evidence that such an investment poses a threat to national security. August 13, 2018, the U.S. adopted a more robust legislation to expand the scope of the committee with the aim to further strengthen and modernize the review process of the CFIUS, the interagency body able to block deals that may threaten national security and ultimately protect itself from any further bank fraud, technology, technology theft, obstruction of justice, and money laundering. This regulatory regime was significantly reformed the year and by the passage into law on the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal years of 2019, which include the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act of 2018, in order to better address national security concern and which expand the authority of the President and the CFIUS to address national security risk of the proposed foreign investment on the national security ground. On March 2021, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Industry and Science and Technology released a report on the review of the Investment Canada Act entitled The Investment Canada Act Responding to the COVID-19 Pandemic and Facilitating Canada Recovery. Most witnesses focused particularly on China and its SOE when it came to national security risk on foreign investment. Certain witnesses highlight the strong link between the Chinese firm and the Chinese Communist Party. The committee ultimately came to conclusion that it's important for Canada to maintain a certain openness of its economy by allowing foreign investment while ensuring that these investments are not injurious to our national security and that they also benefit our country. In total, the committee made nine recommendations of two of these recommendations specifically concern SOE, but one relate to my bill, which is as follow. That the Government of Canada introduce legislation amending Investment Canada Act to reduce the current valuation threshold for pros prospective acquisition of control by either state-owned or state-controlled enterprise to zero, so that every transaction trigger a review including a net benefit test and national security test. 
As such, it is time for Canada to take a stronger approach to protect our national security to respond to situations that are becoming increasingly challenging for our real estate, banking, critical infrastructure, university, and especially emerging technology and sensitive data. My bill would therefore achieve the purpose of rendering all investment in SOE subject to national security review. It further proposed a more through, thorough investment screening process to deal with the backdrop of potential threat to national security posed by an emerging technology, a rising suspicion of the motivation behind investment by strategic competitors and a global economic environment characterized by increased tension, a tit for tat retaliation. Honorable colleague, we need to appreciate what is at stake uh, in this bill, which remain committed to promote free trade and foreign direct investment, including from state-owned enterprise for our economic growth. The government commitment to drive economic growth and attract foreign investment must be achieved while remaining vigilant and active to strengthen our national security from risking state-owned enterprise investment. According to Statistics Canada, foreign direct investment in Canada in 2020 increased by almost 2.75% from the previous year. According to Investment Monitor in 2021, reported by the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, and I quote, SOE make up 18% of all Asia Pacific investment activities in Canada since 2003. However, these transactions have generated over 51% of the total inward investment value with $107.5 billion invested in Canada in the past 18 years. This asymmetry between numbers of deals and investment value highlight the fact that SOE are much more likely than non-SOE to make high-value investment. The natural resources sector attract the vast majority of inward Asian SOE investment. The oil and gas producer sector in particular has accounted for 72% of the total inbound SOE investment value at least 18 years, and I quote. The definition of state-owned enterprise in the Act, as I have highlighted earlier, including individual acting under the direction of the foreign government or an agency of such a government, and as well as individual and enterprise either directly or indirectly influenced by a foreign government or agency. A study conducted by the China Institute of University of Alberta cite the following industry sector as those with the most Chinese direct investment in Canada, energy, metal, and mineral, entertainment, real estate, consumer products, as well as service related to our critical infrastructure, it is estimated that two-thirds of the state-owned of the Chinese investment are located predominantly in British Columbia, followed by Ontario and Alberta. Honorable Senator, something that seems innocuous today, like many of these unreviewed investments, can easily turn into a vulnerability for our security tomorrow. Take a look at the Chinese ban on canola, pork, beef, seafood, for instance. A report conference published by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service in May 2018 called Rethinking Security, Canada, China at the Age of Strategic Rivalry warned that it is relevant, irrelevant whether a Chinese company doing business with a Canadian partner is a state-owned enterprise or not. According to the report, and I quote, whether a Chinese partner company is a state-owned enterprise or private one, it will have closely and increasingly explicit tie to the Chinese Communist Party. End of quote. The report further states that unless trade agreement and investment are carefully vetted for the security implication, the Chinese Communist Party, and I quote, will use its commercial proposed position to gain access to business technology, infrastructure, and can be exploited for intelligent objectives and to potentially compromise a partner's security, end of quote. While the vast majority of foreign investment in Canada is carried out in an open and transparent manner, a number of SOE and private firms with a close tie to the government or intelligence services can pursue corporate acquisition, be it in Canada or other economic activities. 
Corporate accusation by these entities pose potential risk related to vulnerability in critical infrastructure, control strategy, actor espionage, and foreign influence activities, and illegal transfer of technology and expertise. CCs expect that national security concerns related to foreign investment or other economic activities in Canada will continue. I think this resonates all too well with the consequences of outgoing diplomatic rift with China, especially at the time when our foreign direct investment from China and Canada increased by 100.5 percent between 2010-2020. This should not come as a surprise since China economy is centrally planned and led by a filing of 150,000 state-owned enterprises owned by both central and local government controlled by the Chinese Communist Party who pray all manner of technology and data and so overlapping military and civilian use, making our security and surveillance concern of such investment global. About continuous research effort, I remain unable to obtain information about the total level and values of investment made in Canada by foreign non-Chinese state-owned enterprise. However, I will be able to provide some following key examples. North American Oil Sand Corporation takeover uh, by state-owned ASA from Norway, 2007. Prime West Energy Trust takeover in 2008 by Abu Dhabi National Energy Corporation. Harvest Energy Tech Trust takeover in 2009 by Korean National Oil Corp. In 2011, PTT Exploration and Production PLC acquisition by Thailand with 40% joint venture by in with state oil. 2012, Petrona from Malaysia took over Progress Energy Resources Group. In 2015, the acquisition of 50.1% of the Canadian wheat board by Global Grain Group by a joint venture between U.S. food company Bunch Limited and a unit of the Saudi Agriculture and Livestock Investment. Honorable Senator, la croissance nationale de la Chine. Honorable Senators, China's national growth and its expansion on the world stage now depend on the advancement of its One Belt, One Road initiative. initiative. This huge development strategy is growing at an unprecedented rate as huge investments have been made in strategic industries in more than 130 countries, including infrastructure, construction, mining, artificial intelligence, agriculture, fintech, telecommunications, healthcare, culture, banking, and energy, to name, a, to name a few. It is not surprising, then, that parallels are being made between these investments and previous proposals by foreign SOEs that have been approved without rigorous vetting or safety review in recent years. ...of the international community, particularly in the West, are beginning to see Beijing's signature of foreign policy initiative for what it really is, Chinese expansion. On April 21, 2021, the Australian government scrapped the Memorandum of Understanding on the Belt and Road Initiative between the Chinese government and the state government of Victoria, the only such agreement in the country. Only a month following the Group of Seven, G7 Summit, it was announced that plans are underway to launch the Clean Green Initiative. This strategy is to counter Beijing B BRI, would provide a framework to support sustainable development and the green economy. There's a shift in how countries are starting to view China expansionism, and it is about protectionism, but rather about prudence. That said, while Canada carefully assesses all proposed investments from a security perspective, including those that do not result in a change in ownership, the National Security Review Authority remains largely unused. Let me be very clear, BS-234 was drafted in spirit of caution and not protectionism. This bill would help to dispel growing national security concern when it comes to foreign state-sponsored enterprise investment. Honorable Senator, 
Some of you might recall March 2017 when China former ambassador to Canada, Lu Xie, laid out tough conditions for bilateral free trade agreement. During an exclusive interview with the Globe and Mail, he said, and I quote, Beijing will seek unfettered access for Chinese state-owned firm to all key sectors of the Canadian economy during free trade talks, including an end to restriction barring these enterprises from investing in the oil sand, end of quote. Canada needs to be able to function in an open investment climate, but not to the detriment of our national security. We are clearly in the area where state enterprise investment are receiving special attention in the context of the application of national benefit, national security tests under our national investment law, especially now in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is why this bill would prevent any risk tolerant policy shift from putting the safety of Canadians in harm ways. Given the potential challenges posed to the national security as a result of such investment, it is incumbent on Canada to have a legal framework that addresses such proposed investment in a realistic manner. I'm sorry, your time has expired. Senator Duncan.